On the next several slides, we'll have a look at some different types of vibration sensors. So as mentioned previously, there are a number of displacement transducers available to us, and these are generally used in low frequency applications where the relative amplitude of the displacement parameter or variable is significant. And um, this enables us to get good signal to noise ratio in our transducer measurements. There are various types available to us, including a linear variable differential transformer, uh, optical sensors, so uh, laser triangulation sensors. These two sensors will become familiar with in the forthcoming laboratory exercises on mechanical vibration and measurement. There are also proximity probes, which are used for measuring typically a runout, for example, in a shaft orbit scenario. We've got magnus magnetostrictive and capacitive sensors also available. LVDTs are a relatively low cost displacement transducer with pretty good uh, capability over a relatively low frequency range and for relatively low amplitude of uh, displacement vibration. We have a rod which moves in a cylinder essentially and the movement of the rod results in a change in the voltage output that we get from the LVDT and within a certain range as you can see by the lines uh, either side of uh, this proportional region in figure B and indeed in figure D, depending on the nature of the excitation, then we get a relatively proportional uh, output of voltage with respect to changes in displacement. We'll have a look at these in the um, laboratory exercises that we have coming up on uh, MVM in the next weeks. The other type of displacement tr transducer that we're primarily interested in for the moment on mechanical vibration and measurement is an optical displacement transducer. This is a laser triangulation sensor which operates by sending a laser beam towards a target and as the target moves the reflected light laser beam is deviated as a result of the change of the incident point and we use a photo detector or a light receiving element essentially to capture the returned light and the position of that returned light is proportional to the motion of the surface. It's non-contact, it operates within a certain range, so we need to have it uh, a certain distance away from the target, of course. Uh, we need the target to be fairly optically, um, uh, let's say, um, well-behaved to be able to get signal back. It's got a pretty good frequency response, much uh, larger frequency response than the LVDT because there's no mass attached to the structure, no moving parts, so we can get frequency response up to a much higher uh, range, but we have limited um, displacement amplitude capability and they, we can have some uh, noise effects so when the displacement gets very small in the same ways for LVDT um, the measurement can be subjected to quite a bit of uh, noise as a result of the uh, environment and so on around the sensor but low cost and pretty good overall to calibrate our LVDT, and this is important for the laboratory exercise that you'll do in week five, we have to insert a known displacement, a fixed amount of ma uh, displacement into the LVDT rod. So we change the position of the rod relative to the surface um, by introducing this slip gauge which gives us an alternative voltage and then we can clearly take the voltage before and the voltage after, divide that by the amount of uh, displacement that we've introduced, a static displacement, and then we have a sensitivity for our instrument, for our transducer. Often with measurement transducers, it's not sufficient to only do a static calibration of the device and um, because we get different behavior potentially in a dynamic scenario, for example, there may be a frequency dependent calibration and so it's often uh, required to do a dynamic calibration as well. There's no simple way to do this for displacement transducers. We typically would introduce a reference measurement, which might, for example, be a laser vibrometer, of course. We've not yet discussed laser vibrometers, but these measure velocity, so we would need to integrate velocity to get a displacement measurement to compare with that of our displacement transducer, which would be sitting alongside it. And we would introduce some vibration of a fixed frequency and fixed amplitude using an electrodynamic shaker, which both of these transducers would be attached to. Velocity transducers, on the other hand, are very useful because they allow us to do direct measurement of the optimum velocity uh, or the optimum vibration parameter, i.e. Uh, velocity. It, these velocity transducers typically will make a relative measurement of vibration velocity, so we need to have a stable mounting reference upon which to sit them. And there are various types 
although the one that we will really focus on during the course of this uh, subject is the laser Doppler vibrometer. The laser triangulation sensor for measurement of displacement. The laser vibrometer is again a non-contact uh, vibration transducer. That means there's no mass loading. We have a very high frequency range for the laser vibrometer. It relies on the Doppler shift of backscattered light from the moving surface to enable us to be able to detect the velocity from that surface. Indeed, the Doppler shift is directly proportional to the velocity of the surface. And it, inside the vibrometer is an interferometer which allows us to be able to make measurements in both uh, positive and negative directions for vibration. That's of course important. We have the ability to fit the laser vibrometer with beam steering mirrors to the front of it such that we can rapidly make measurement surveys or vibration surveys across a structure of interest at many locations. The flip side of these sensors is that they are relatively expensive. Uh, at least 25,000 for a portable digital vibrometer, the one that we can see in this measurement uh, here, which has uh, been attached to a six degree of freedom robot such that it, the laser beam can be manipulated around this structure of interest, which is three dimensional in nature. And we can do an experimental model analysis of this structure using this non-contact vibration measurement technique. The alternative to using a relatively expensive vibration velocity transducer such as the LDV is to use uh, an indirect velocity measurement uh, technique. Uh, in other words, we can make an acceleration measurement using uh, an accelerometer which are relatively low cost on the order of a thousand or several thousand dollars for a very precise research grade uh, transducer, transducers that are fitted in our uh, smartphones and other devices that are uh, made from uh, MEMS uh, chips are much lower cost. They are not quite as uh, linear in terms of their response and each one has to be calibrated independently. Uh, that's why they're much cheaper but uh, one of these devices can be used to make a measurement of acceleration and then integrate it for velocity. Brings us nicely onto accelerometers themselves, which are very useful transducers. They're ubiquitous. All engineering companies will have accelerometers. They come in various different types and have different signal conditioning requirements depending upon the nature of this transducer. So we have piezo resistive, piezo electric, which are very common, and capacitive sensors. They all rely on, or most rely on, effectively a mass, which is a single degree of freedom. It's connected to a spring. Essentially, we have a single degree of freedom system. So when we introduce a vibration, we get um, we get um, some motion of this mass, which acts on an element within the transducer. For example, in the piezoelectric case, we have some compression of a piezoelectric material, which results in a charge, which is proportional to that uh, force which has been applied, which is indeed proportional to the acceleration as a result of the mass. Um, piezo-resistive accelerometers operate by virtue of the fact that a mass is attached to a beam which is able to bend as a result of the acceleration of the accelerometer which leads to the mass vibrating and the beam itself, the yellow element in this case, has got a couple of strain gauges, two or four strain gauges attached to it in a certain configuration. A Wheatstone bridge is used to uh, complete the strain gauge circuit and any vibration indeed any uh, even indeed acceleration due to gravity because of the result of the bending of the beam just because of the fact that the mass is attached is measured by this transducer so it's a DC coupled measurement that we extract and we have an output from the sensor typically in, in terms of millivolts per G the voltage amplifier and amplifier is attached immediately after the strain gauges so we get an output directly proportional to acceleration MEMS PZO resistive accelerometers operate on the same principle as that described previously in that we have effectively a mass uh, attached to a beam but in this case the whole uh, unit or item is, is etched into uh, silicon which is on a chip uh, known as a microelectromechanical system. That makes for these types of sensors to be very compact and as such they can be incorporated within electronic devices such as those that we carry around with us, our smartphones. Um, to give us indications of X, Y, and Z accelerations. They're also uh, mounted into airbags within vehicles to detect, uh, to detect uh, shock. And they also have an output in terms of volts per G. Piezoelectric accelerometers are a very common, common form of 
kind of measurement accelerometer, and there are a number of companies, including Bruland, Kia, Endevco, uh, Ditran, and a number of others that are globally supplying vast numbers of these accelerometers into all in industry sectors, automotive, aerospace, defense, and so on. In this case, the piezoelectric element is the uh, item that effectively behaves like a spring, and there's a seismic mass attached to the top of that. When the piezoelectric element is compressed or a force is applied to it, that results in a charge being generated, and that charge is of the order of picocoulomb, so it needs to be amplified very quickly uh, after the uh, transducer, we have a charge amplifier which um, amplifies the picocoulomb charge and converts that into a voltage proportional to the acceleration. So the output of the transducer itself is in picocoulombs. Sensitivity is specified picocoulombs per G, but we uh, amplify that very soon afterwards. We have low noise cables that connect the amplifier, the transducer to the amplifier, and thereafter the amplifier we measure voltage. We can capture that in our acquisition system, data acquisition system, and record that for further an, uh, analysis. These devices uh, have a very high resonant frequency due to the stiffness of the piezoelectric material. We've got a wide dynamic range, very low noise floor. But they're, in this case, they're AC coupled, unlike piezoresistive accelerometers, so they're not sensitive to gravity so we don't make a measurement of gravity there's no static uh, acceleration measures as, as a result of the gravitational effect it's important at this stage to just quickly describe ac versus dc coupling so dc coupling essentially allows us to capture the entire signal including the dc uh, component of it so in the case of a piezo resistive accelerometer where we measure as well as any vibrating acceleration, acceleration due to gravity, we would have a DC offset on a fluctuating signal. And if we capture that in an oscilloscope with DC coupling, we will see the whole signal. If alternatively we AC couple our acquisition system, we would reject the DC component, i.e. gravity, and we would only then measure the um, fluctuating or the AC acceleration signal. It's an analog filter typically, so we get a cutoff that may be around the order of 10 hertz, a relatively low uh, frequency cutoff, but it does have some roll off, and um, so it's not a perfect digital filter. So we do need to bear that in mind when we're making vibration measurements. In recent years, with the miniaturization of integrated circuits, it's been possible to do the amplification of the charge signal that's generated in a piezoelectric transducer, actually on a small electronic chip, which is inside the accelerometer. To be able to do this, we need to provide that electronic circuit, which is inside the accelerometer, with a voltage and some current to be able to power those electronics. And so we have a um, a power supply, which is the blue box in this slide that connects via a cable to the uh, transducer. And that signal that's provided essentially is uh, modulated by the any vibration that occurs as a result of the accelerometer being attached to a vibrating surface. And we are able to measure that acceleration by interrogating that uh, fluctuating uh, signal that comes back from the accelerometer. We have um, Similarly, good dynamic range is somewhat reduced, perhaps, compared with piezoelectric accelerometers. We have to take care of the fact that the electronics are relatively sensitive, so it's not a high temperature application. So we can't mount these to, for example, exhaust systems because the electronics would just be cooked. So it's a maximum 70 degrees uh, application for this type of transducer. Again, it's AC coupled. Essentially, it's the same as a piezoelectric accelerometer in those respects. At this point in the class, we'll do an in-class exercise. At this point in the lecture in the class, there would be a demonstration on accelerometers.